We're going to walk you through how to do some thermochemistry calculations uh, using specific heat capacity, heat diffusion, heat of vaporization. And I'm going to show you how to organize them using an LOL diagram as well as a heating curve to kind of make it a little easier to figure out exactly what to do. So our first question here, we have 14.7 uh, grams of ice, we melt it, and then we heat it up until it reaches the final temperature, uh, how much heat is required. So I'm going to take that question and I'm going to break that down into an LOL diagram. Uh, if you've never done an LOL diagram, I have another video posted that will kind of show you how to do them, but, or at least what the cutoffs. But essentially it organizes the energy of the system, which in this case is our ice and water. It organizes the energy into thermal, phase, and chemical. Uh, in this case, we're not changing what chemical we have, so we can ignore chemical. Um, and we're starting with ice at zero degrees, so we're going to start with a single bar of thermal energy, not very much. And for phase, we're going to start with a single bar of phase energy. And then we're changing the phase to liquid, so we're going to increase that. And the temperature is going from 0 degrees to 76.2, so we're going to end up with about 3 bars of thermal energy. <clears throat> so if you're new to these, generally speaking, we go about 0 degrees, about 20 degrees, about 70 degrees, about 100 degrees. These are not meant to be qual uh, quantitative, just qualitative. Uh, 1 for solid, 2 for liquid, 4 for uh, gas. Okay. So what we see here happening is two different things. One we see that the phase energy is going up for the system. So I have a bar of phase energy coming into the ice. And I have two bars of thermal energy coming into the ice as well. For the phase energy, I'm going to be doing a calculation using one of these enthalpy of fusion or vaporizations. Since I'm changing from solid to liquid, I'm going to be using the enthalpy of fusion. For the thermal energy, I'm going to be doing a uh, so the key capacity calculation based on the temperature change. So if I were to mark on my heating curve where I'm kind of starting and ending, I am starting with all ice at zero degrees. So here's my zero degree mark. I then melt all of that ice. That's going to be one calculation. We'll call that Q1. And then I heat it up until I get to about 76.2 degrees. So from here to here is my second Q. So for the calculations then, what I'm going to do is Q1 for the melting of the ice for the phase energy change, I'm going to be doing 14.7 grams times the enthalpy of fusion 334 joules per gram. And I'm going to get some value. For the second amount of energy, Q2, I'm going to do an MCAT problem. I'm going to do a specific heat capacity problem. So I'm going to have 14.7 grams times 4.18 joules per gram per degree Celsius. And then my temperature change, I'm going from 0 to 76.2. So I get two different Q values, and then the total is just going to be how much energy total is applied. So 14.7 times 334, this comes out to be 4,900 joules. And the second one is 4,680 joules. Technically, 4,910. So then, for the total, I would just add those two together, and we get 9,590 joules. So for the entire process, the melting takes this much, the heating takes this much. My total then is the sum of those two, which would be 9,590 joules. What's nice about this, <coughs> excuse me, is that we're separating out the thermal and phase energy, which shows you kind of how the calculations are going to go. And if we had done more phase energy or more thermal energy, it is possible we would have had to do multiple calculations within those bars. Uh, the heating curve allows us to kind of figure out how many steps we're going to have. So we're starting here. Anytime you make a change in slope, you're going to be doing a new calculation. So here's our first calculation. Here's our second. If we had continued on, we would have gotten to a third and eventually a fourth. If we had cooled, we would have gone through a calculation there. So, so the heating curve and the uh, diagram here kind of gave you some guidance into that. But this in particular is nice because this allows you to quickly disseminate whether it's endo or exothermic and in regards to both system and surroundings. 
In this case, the system is undergoing an endothermic change because energy is going into the system, which means that the surroundings are undergoing an exothermic change. And for many people, they try and assign endothermic and exothermic to one thing. There's always both. There's always both, unless you have a change of zero, in which case that would be kind of a pointless discussion. But if you are changing your energy from system to surroundings, one of those is exothermic and one of those is endothermic. So for a new student, when a teacher sits there and says, oh, ice melting is endothermic, but then a chemical reaction in water is exothermic, that can be really confusing. And that's because what's being defined as the system and the surroundings is not clear to a new student. So defining your system and then being able to draw where the energy is going will greatly alleviate that concern, and therefore I can assign a positive to this quite easily. All right, so let's try a few more problems. If you want to try the other ones ahead of time, you can go ahead and Google the link to this uh, presentation is in there. So it's number two, I have a metal, I add some energy, it goes up in temperature, find a specific heat capacity. So for this, I'm gonna go ahead and fill out my LOL diagram. So I'm starting with a solid metal that is, it doesn't say what temperature it is. So let's just go and assume it's at room temperature. So two bars, one bar of phase end up with one bar phase, and let's say that it goes up enough that I give it three bars of thermal. So I have one bar of energy going into my system, which is the metal. Phase is not changing. As far as my curve goes, I'm starting somewhere along the solid curve and ending somewhere that's 22.3 20, degrees higher. So only a single calculation here. going to be an MC delta T calculation. So I know that I have 278 joules. That would be Q. My mass is 28.4. And in specific heat, and the temperature change is 22.3 degrees Celsius. So what I can do then is I can solve for the specific heat capacity by taking that 278 and dividing it by the mass, dividing it by the temperature change. And when I do that, I get a specific heat capacity of 0 .4, 0 0.439 joules per gram per degree Celsius. And it looks like I have three sig figs for everything, so that's fine. <coughs> so now it would have been endothermic for the metal. All right, number three, I have some ice at zero degrees. I heat it to its boiling point, 72 grams of boil away. So I got a lot of stuff going on here. So let's go ahead and fill out our LOL diagram to kind of set that up. So this one is where this is going to come in really handy. So we start with thermal energy of one bar, phase energy of one bar. Okay, we end with some steam and some liquid. So I'm going to give three bars for our phase, kind of between the two and the four. And then for a thermal, I end up at 100 degrees for all of those water molecules. So I'm looking at the water as my system, and I have three bars of thermal coming in, and I have two bars of phase coming in. And the two bars of phase are different. One of them, <coughs> one of them is going to be with the enthalpy of vaporization, the other one is going to be with the enthalpy of fusion. On my heating curve, I'm starting here at point B, and I'm ending we're 72 out of 129, so I'm ending somewhere in here where I've boiled away some of my water, but not all of it. So I'm going to have Q1, Q2, and Q3 on this, but I'm going to need to add all of them together. Okay. So let's see here. We have 129 grams at zero degrees. First thing we're going to do is we're going to melt. So our Q1 is going to be 129 grams times the 334 joules per gram, the enthalpy of fusion. Okay. My second Q, I'm going to be heating the water from 0 degrees to 100 degrees. So that's an MCAT calculation. And my delta T in that is the difference in the melting and boiling point, so it would be 100 degrees Celsius. And then my third Q is going to be how much energy it takes to boil away the 72 grams of ice, or 72 grams of water. 
So I'm just going to do 72 grams times the enthalpy of vaporization. And then I want a total of all three of those. So I'm going to take 129 times 334. That comes out to 43,100. And then I'm going to add to that 129 times the 4.18 times 100. And then I'm going to add to that 72 times 2260. And I get a total of 260,000 joules. And so that would be the total amount of energy. And we can see in here that one of these bars is this, and the other one is this. Okay, so this organizational tool along with this helps us to go through and organize this particular problem. I have one more. Number four. <coughs> Excuse me. 18 grams of steam condenses, cools down to room temperature, determine the energy released. So, for our LOL diagram, we have steam. So 18 grams, so we're at 100 degrees or more for our steam. For our phase, we're at steam, so we're, we're in gas state. So we start with four bars of each. Okay. It condenses down to room temperature. So room temperature, we're going to assign to be two bars of thermal. And for phase, we're going to assign to be two bars of phase. Okay, so again, we've got two things going on, but this case is different than the previous three. In this one, I have two bars of energy leaving for phase, and I have two bars of energy leaving for thermal. Okay, on my heating curve, I am starting with steam. I'm assuming it starts at 100 degrees, and that's going to cool down to 24 degrees. So I've got Q1 and Q2. And what's different about this problem is that this one is exothermic, and this one, my steam that I start with, is releasing energy to the surroundings. And so, in this case, uh, we could consider my Q to be negative for the steam and positive for the surroundings, uh, if we would like to. So, nonetheless, I have two Qs to calculate, and I'm going to add them together. I've got 18 grams. And then 2,260 joules per gram to condense that steam. And the second one, we have 18 grams times 4.18 joules per gram per degree Celsius. And our temperature change is from 100 to 24. That's a difference of 76 degrees. Okay. Now, that temperature change, we can consider to be a negative value, giving us a negative Q. We can also consider this constant to be a negative value because it's designed for condensing. Um, and so I'm going to take these two things, I'm going to add them together, but I'm going to make the final answer into a negative. So my total Q, combination of Q1 and Q2 is 2 sig figs, 46,000 joules. I'm going to call that to be a negative. Okay. So when you're doing this, even though it may seem slightly laborious, it's pretty quick if you have the diagram set up for you, uh, the ability to always have an endo and exothermic clearly labeled and always to assign a system and assign a surroundings can be very, very impactful for someone who's struggling with trying to figure out where all these numbers are heading towards. Uh, so the interpretation of endo and exothermic can be helped along greatly by doing these LOL diagrams. And the number of calculations can be helped by doing the heating curves. And by doing both, you're really analyzing every single problem at such a deep level. You're going to build a lot of solid understanding from doing that.